we need to wrap up anthropological approaches to human environment relationships. And so we left off looking at these different approaches. You've heard all this, let me just recap a bit. We started with the interpretive approach. Uh, this idea that worldview, what's in people's heads, how they think about the world around them will drive behavior. And this is one way to understand what leads to different types of societies, right? Because they have different ideologies that drives how they organize. We also looked at the opposite approach, uh, the materialist approach, which says it's not so much worldview, rather the most important driving force is meeting people's basic needs. And so from a materialist perspective, it is how does this group adapt to their local environment via the material forces, subsistence strategy, technology, economic patterns, and how does that shape other aspects of the culture like population size or the degree of equality or inequality? Uh, materialist approach, right, from the environment on up. Uh, then we moved on to human ecology, which sort of blends both interpretive and materialist approaches. It, it's the standpoint that everything is indeed interconnected and we don't have a social and ecological system. Rather, we have one total interconnected socio-ecological system with feedback effects. Human ecology's weakness is it doesn't really account for power differences among individuals and groups. And so in the sense that we all interact with the environment, maybe, uh, maybe a natural disaster strikes, maybe through the resources we have access to, but that interaction is not equal, right? Some enjoy many of the benefits of that interaction while uh, other groups bear sort of the costs of that interaction. This brings us to political ecology, which accounts for these power differences. And this is sort of what Bodley's approach is all about. Um, looking at human environment interaction, but how power dynamics shape that interaction in a very unequal way, right? And so, so really all we have left to cover is Bodley. And there's sort of a lot of writing on the slides just so that you have it because his theory is a guiding theme throughout the course, um, this anthropology course. So that's the perspective we're taking. Evolution doesn't mean better or more progressed or more advanced. It just means simply change, change over time. Could be good, could be bad, could be neutral. It means change over time. Biological evolution, the change in the genetic characteristics of a population over time, right? Those traits that maybe give a survival or a reproductive advantage, these individuals will survive and reproduce in higher numbers, uh, passing those traits on to the future. And so if different life forms could have arisen through this process of biological change, then is this also through a process of change how we got all these different types of societies? And so culture, just again, is it's these shared ways of thinking and behaving, uh, shared among the group, socially learned, passed down generationally. It's culture is useful, right? It's what allows us to, as a human species, adapt to almost every sort of environment on this planet. It's what puts food in our mouths, uh, clothes on our back if necessary, shelter if necessary, depending on the environment. It's useful. It's a, the way we adapt to our environments as a species. Uh, and so adaptation then, characteristics and systems that enable human populations to survive and reproduce in their habitats. Different cultural forms around the world have arisen through a process of adapting to their particular environments. If you go up into the Arctic, the Inuit have very specialized ways for hunting marine life under the sea ice. They have specialized technology and knowledge for that environment. If you go down to South America, the Brazilian Amazon, um, the Iquana have sort of blow guns that shoot poison darts uh, through prey running through the trees. So it's all about um, you're only so well fit in an evolutionary sense, adapted, always in relation to the environment that you inhabit. Um, and just on a side note, this is, this is what happened to the dinosaurs, right? Biological evolution moves at a glacial pace. It cannot keep pace with rapid environmental change. Um, the environment during 65 million years ago, right? Big meteor impact created a nuclear winter, killed off all the vegetation, in turn killing off the dinosaurs that fed off this vegetation. And so Bodley's culture scale approach, his main focus is that cultural evolution in recent centuries, recent time, has been towards a larger scale. 
And remember, it changed towards a larger scale. It doesn't mean better or more well adapted, just means larger. Uh, and he categorizes societies based off their organizational form into these three main worlds, uh, tribal, imperial, and commercial. At each level, and these are in chronological order, you see an increase in the social scale of the society, meaning the population is much larger. Um, the overall scale is bigger. There is more cultural complexity, meaning a lot more parts. Things become very specialized. Um, among the Kung hunter-gatherers, the shaman, sort of the, the religious practitioner, is also a hunter, also a dad, also other the, all these other things. Um, in industrial, post-industrial societies, we become highly specialized, right? There's all these parts. It's very complex. Think bureaucracy. Think when you need to get a signature at SDSU, how many steps you have to, to jump through, right? That's what we mean when we say complex. It means more parts. It doesn't mean better. And at each level, you see a greater concentration of social power, meaning that Decision, power over decision making um, of the policies that affect all of us is becoming concentrated in fewer, fewer hands. This is sort of the, the type of social organization that humans have spent the majority of their existence in. Um, again, anatomically modern Homo sapiens been around a couple hundred thousand years, really not that much different from our hominin ancestors two million years ago. So the tribal world, it's small scale. You have groups, uh, societies, maybe of a couple hundred to a couple thousand people, but dispersed across the landscape. They're separated geographically. They're clustered into these, uh, what we call bands or small villages of maybe 25, 100 people. Separated geographically because the landscape can't support higher population densities. They're hunter-gatherers. But all these different bands are connected through intermarriage, kinship, trade, and other means. Their subsistence is hunting and gathering. They subsist off the resources available, wild resources available in their environment. The main driving force among this type of society is humanization. Humanization refers to meeting everyone's basic needs, um, human needs, food, water, reproduction, whatever that might be. Uh, the driving force in the way they organize, the way they make decisions, how big they let the population get, the main driving force shaping all of that is this concern with making sure people's hu uh, needs are met, humanization. That's the goal. That's what shapes all else. Also, they don't have markets. That's not how their economy works. Uh, sort of everyone's involved personally. They participate in either gathering few food or whatever that might be. And everyone plays a role in decision making um, so that you don't have any single individual that is making decisions for the group. Um, everyone has a say in that and leadership's achieved, meaning that you earn it through respect, through charisma, through making decisions that are beneficial to everyone because it's achieved, it's reversible. So if you stop making choices that are good for others and you're making them in your own personal interest, the group will simply stop listening to you, right? It's reversible. So they're often referred to as the original affluent society. Affluency, not in the sense of money or material wealth, but wealthy in the sense of non-material well-being. Um, and material, they have what they need, right? Their needs are met, uh, and they can meet their needs with what they have available to them in their environment. And, they, and also their needs are limited. They don't expand into these ever-increasing wants, right? And so when you have enough stuff and everyone else around you has pretty much the same stuff. And there's no commercials, right, telling you that you're not cool enough or you could be better if you bought this. Then enough is sort of enough, right? So this is the tribal world. This brings us to the imperial world. So hunter-gatherers have been around, still sort of around today, although they've been largely marginalized off their own lands. The next type of major social organization to emerge in, in Bodley's categorization, the imperial world. The imperial world, it, you can think of the, the ancient Aztecs, uh, the ancient Inca, ancient Egyptians, uh, Mesoamerica, Mesopotamian civilizations, all these early farming societies and our first civilizations. And so at the imperial level, things have moved towards a larger scale. You have much larger populations and also more complex social organization. And so remember, as the way people organize around their resource base changes, so will other aspects of the culture. 
in this region, uh, per, let's just take the Aztecs in Mesoamerica, farming became viable at some point with the start of the Holocene. And so at some point, this group starts farming. This creates agricultural surplus. There's now much more food being produced in that same area of land than there was when people were just hunting and gathering. <clears throat> surplus changes everything. With surplus, you no longer need everyone in the population engaged in producing food, engaged in farming. You only need a proportion of that population farming to produce enough food to feed everyone else. People also are sedentary now. They're not moving around because their, their food's all in one place, right? They're not following available resources or game, depending on seasonal changes. They're modifying their environment on a large scale to grow food. So they become sedentary and populations start becoming much larger in the thousands and even tens of thousands. With surplus sedentism in these larger populations, you also start to see specialization emerge. This means people start to specialize. Their time has been freed up. They're not all engaged in farming. They start specializing in other occupational tasks, whether that's you know, tool making or metallurgy or craftsmanship. Specialization then over time allow, starts to create differences in people's status, um, sort of different social classes. Also because people aren't moving around anymore, they can accumulate wealth over time, um, not only just within their lifetime, but over several generations. So you start seeing di major differences in wealth and also status. And this is the emergence of social stratification, having different social classes uh, with differential access to culturally valued rewards, right? whether that's you know, power, prestige, or resources. <clears throat> and so you, get, you start getting a, a centralization of power. Uh, and the existence of elites, these upper people in the upper class, sort of the 1%. Bodley says it's at this point that politicization takes over. Humanization, making sure everyone's got food in their belly and uh, their needs met, is no longer the driving force. Rather, politicization, the formation and sort of ma maintenance of these politically centralized societies become the driving force. Right? The elite sort of have power, and so it's all about maintaining that status quo. Uh, however, and this is a really important difference between the imperial world and the commercial world, even though the elite, the decision makers, the rulers, they may not be making decisions that are always in the best interest of everyone else in that society or the environment, but the rulers still had a vested interest in making sure the needs of those below them were met, that humanization process, because this is who pro provides food for the whole population. So if they let the masses below them, if they're, they're not sort of taken care of, they don't have a basic standard of living, uh, there goes the food source for the entire population. So you start getting leaders, rulers, hereditary leadership that may not really be aligned with the interests of the group. They might be aggrandizing themselves or seeking, you know, individual gain. But again, they still have this vested interest in the population below them because that's who produces their food. So, the, so imperial societies uh, emerged with agriculture 12,000 years ago in different places, and they repeatedly uh, sort of grow and eventually collapse. And these cycles repeat until about 1350 AD. At this time, um, trade, colonialism, a little bit later, travel, uh, missionization, basically global, the first stages of globalization start happening. The world starts becoming more interconnected, uh, which then eventually allowed the emergence of fully fledged commercial society. Which brings us to the commercial world, uh, the largest scale in Bodley's scheme. And really this type of social organization, the ones we're all used to, um, how we've grown up, the, what we know, this is very recent in human existence. It's only been around a couple hundred years. You start, now you have a fully global economy meaning that the markets all over the globe are connected, not just for you to buy from, but also to sell to. And you also start getting for-profit business. This starts to become one of the main driving forces structuring the society. This is what Bali calls the commercialization process, where for-profit business and increasing profits 
becomes the driving force. It supersedes humanization and politicization. <clears throat> And you start getting how this happens, how power is so concentrated, is the, our leaders, our decision makers, our politicians, uh, they start forming alliances with the economic leaders, the economic elite, so that our political leaders, the ones that are supposed to be keeping us safe, regulating companies and industries, um, again, to keep us safe, these political leaders and the people that run these companies are becoming the same person. Rex Tillerson, for example, uh, one of our most recent secretaries of state under Donald Trump, before he was nominated to secretary of, of state, he was the CEO of Exxon, of a, of a fossil fuel company, right? So you're working in a company, then you go into the regulatory agency that has been created to regulate your company, go in and change the rules and then go back into the private industry. And this happens all over the place. Um, Clarence Thomas, I was looking him up. He's one of our Supreme Court justices. Uh, he used to be a lawyer for Monsanto, right? A private lawyer for Monsanto. So there's all these conflicts of interest. An even more recent example, the head of health and human services in our country. I just heard about this it happened today. The head of HHS in our country, which is important right now with COVID and the pandemic. Uh, his name's Caputo. He's just stepped down or was fired today. Does anyone know what he did before he became the top leader of health and human services for our entire country? Neither did I until I saw it on the news. He was a political aide for Russia. So when Bodley says you, you're getting alliances between political and economic elites, this is what he's talking about. They're becoming sort of one in the same, right? Why is someone that used to, I don't, I don't care, do, do politics, be a political aide for Russia, but then you're leading the department in charge of health and human services for an entire country? So what, what's going on there, right? So Bali says at this point, it's for-profit business and sort of increasing profit margins. This becomes the driving force structuring the society that we all live in so that policies um, don't necessarily benefit us, but the sort of the companies that are making all the profits. Uh, and then one last thing is he's, these decision makers, the elites, they make decisions that aren't really good for the rest of us, right? Maybe increase the profit margins of Monsanto or someone else, but hurt the rest of us. And then they are insulated from the impact of these negative policies um, because either they're not affected by it, and so they don't recognize it, or because they're not affected by it, they don't care, and so they don't correct for it because it doesn't negatively affect them. Either way, it's really hard to correct this maladaptive behavior once it's begun. And so his key argument, and again, sort of a lot of words here for you, so you have it, is this growth in scale becoming larger, more complex. It occurs because elites seek to increase their social power. And when power becomes too concentrated, uh, you have too few people making choices that affect all of us that are so different in our needs and situations. When power is too concentrated, overall social and cultural resiliency, the well-being of the broader society, and sustainability becomes threatened. Again, our leaders are making decisions that might be good for them as individuals, but not for the broader social and, and environment. And so um, just, just to back up, this key argument, this growth in scale occurs because elites seek to increase their social power. So, like, for example, in, in our society, and of course, this is income dependent, situation dependent, but many of us, we could jump in our car and go buy um, strawberries or watermelon or something like that at the store a couple miles away. Again, income dependent, depends on if you live in a food desert, all these other things we'll talk about in a couple weeks. And so there's a, there's a benefit to that if you, if you feel like going to get strawberries and having them in 10 minutes. And I think, you know, many of us, participate in this, but there's all these other drawbacks to that, right? To having this stable, specialized uh, economy that allows us to eat fruit almost any time out of the year that is grown 3,000 miles away. 
And so it's very specialized. You have all the fossil fuels, technology, fertilizer inputs going into growing that food year round, uh, fossil fuels, electricity involved in the transportation of getting it to the store, plus your own car and you're getting yourself to the store. So it could really convenient, right? That's one bonus, convenient. We can have strawberries whenever we want. Um, but so many costs through exploitative labor practices, through polluting the environment that aren't priced into that. And so who is that really for? Maybe a little bit for us. Yeah, we can go get strawberries wherever you want. But it also allows these companies to make enormous amounts of money off selling food as essentially commodities, right? And because they're not actually paying for everything that goes into that, right? The costs are subsidized or deferred onto the rest of us. Um, they're just reaping in the profit. So things get larger, more complex. We transport food from across the world, um, not because there's hungry people there, but because someone's making a ton of money off doing it that way. Um, so the larger, the more complex, again, um, it's, a, it's a problem. And what it does is it, it just allows people to siphon even more money off. And so one really important aspect of Bodley's whole approach is this focus on power. How does, who has the power? Who controls the decision making? How does this drive the system? You want to understand contemporary problems today? Look at who has power over decision making. And, and why are they making these decisions? What's their agenda? Is it in our interests or their own personal interests? A few more things. Uh, and so consequences of larger scale, Bodley says that cultural evolution at this point has become fundamentally a political process. It's no longer about being well adapted to your environment or meeting everyone's needs. Uh, it's political and about profits. Elites, the decision makers, make decisions that benefit themselves, but might be maladaptive, excuse me, to the population as a whole. And again, they do this because they're either not affected by the maladaptive consequences of their decisions, and so they don't recognize it, or because they're not affected, they do not care. They do not correct for it. Um, just a real quick example of that. I had a, a mentor, a teacher, and a medical anthropologist, and she did work with the downwinders population. Does anyone know who that is, the downwinders? kind of a specific jargony term. It was um, different groups of the US population that were purposely exposed to nuclear radiation by the US government. Um, they were blowing up nuclear bombs. They, they let it affect parts of our military and also people that lived in the area. And I remember her telling this story about the sort of the politician in charge calls his daughter-in-law who's pregnant, um, is about to have a baby. And she's living in one of these towns that are part of the downwinders. Downwinder referring to um, the way, wherever the wind's blowing, it's blowing that radiation into the town. And so he calls her up and says, you, you guys need to move. And the pregnant daughter-in-law says, no, we just saw on the news that we were told we don't have to move. Everything's fine. There's no risk. And the politician, no, you need to move. And so it's sort of what happened is they're telling everyone publicly, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, no, don't, you don't need to wear a mask. COVID's not a thing. Um, when privately, they actually know it's a very real threat. Um, and people died from that, from being exposed to the radiation, getting cancer, um, whole, whole entire towns, plus some of our military members. Um, so that's kind of, that's a, one example of what I mean when I say elites make decisions that might benefit them, but not the rest of us, right? And this maladaptive behavior is not easily corrected, right? We get rid of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, uh, protected lands. You can't just undo that once those resources have been sort of plundered and polluted. So this notion of progress is often conflated with evolution and that's problematic. How do you measure success, evolutionary success? A lot of people talk about progress. Um, you still hear it today. And what is progress? It's sort of a value-laden term, right? Uh, progress, running water, maybe. Electricity, maybe. Um, what about the fact that 5.5 billion people in this world are somewhere on the global hunger index? Right. That was in one of your bodily readings. Five, in 2010, 5.5 billion people in this world, somewhere on a global hunger index, meaning they're facing some form of malnutrition. That's well over half. 
right? Is that progress? Um, that a billion people are in abject poverty, probably won't even see one out of their several children make it to adulthood. Is that progress? So what do we mean when we say progress and progress for who? And so if you really want to measure adaptive success, you don't do it with value laden subjective terms like progress. Um, Solins at anthropologist Bodley talks about this. You really want to measure success. You do it through long term survival right through how long is the society the species been around how well adapted are they to their environment right in order to survive and reproduce and so if you look at things from this perspective um foraging the tribal world hunter gatherers have been much more su successful than mechanized agriculture as subsistence um industrial societies right foraging has been around all of our existence uh mechanized agriculture a couple hundred years, right? Not even a dot on the page yet. And we're seeing massive, massive, potentially adverse consequences. A few more things to wrap up on Bodley. The smaller scale societies tend to be relative to large scale, more efficient in their energy use because they rely on the local environment. Um, wind, solar, animals, soil fertility, whatever that may be, they're not subsidizing their energy budget and their activities with fossil fuels and resources borrowed from other places. It tends to be more efficient. They tend to be more stable. Be again, because they rely on the local environment, they're not relying on, you know, commodities or food or fossil fuels from 3,000 miles away. So they're not vulnerable to changes in these external factors. They tend to be better adapted to local environments. Again, this is because they rely on their local environment. They're, they have deep ecological knowledge of it. They can react to detrimental changes immediately so as to not undercut their resource base. They tend to be more resilient in recovering from disturbances. Uh, this is because kind of, so back to my strawberry at the store example, um, industrial society is highly specialized. And one benefit of that is efficiency, right? We can go in less than an hour, we'll probably much less, go grab strawberries from the store, right? So it's efficient, um, highly specialized, but there's a trade-off. It's also less resilient, it's more vulnerable. So there's so many places in that chain from where the food is grown to you buying it at the store for things to go wrong, for oil prices to go up, for um, pests, to wipe out that crop for whatever. There's so many places for things to go wrong that while specialization might make things convenient, efficient for us, uh, it's not resilient. It can't really withstand um, external disturbances. It, it falls down. Um, smaller scale societies are more resilient in recovering from disturbances. Again, they're not as highly specialized. They're more well adapted to their local environment. This also allows them to provide a greater diversity to solutions to their problems. They have more efficient feedback systems. As soon as their activities have a negative effect on their resource base, they can see that, they can correct for it. Um, in contrast, we tend to affect other people's environments and other continents and countries. We're not always aware of the detrimental impact we're having or we're not affected by it, so we don't really correct for it. They tend to have less overall impact on the environment just by the nature of the way they're organized, right? And what the driving force is among these groups. And so large scale technological complexity, complex machinery, the use of fossil fuels, these do not free us from nature. They actually allow us to exploit even more resources, bringing us closer to the limits of nature um, through depleting ecosystems. We, I mean, we never do run out of resources. We come up with a new technology that allows us to just go right on, continue extracting. Um, continuing to pollute ecosystems and contributing to dangerous climate. Climate has always fluctuated, but oh my God, not in such a short period of time, right? This is anthropogenic, this is human cause. And so for Bodley, cultural evolution doesn't have anything to do with progress and it need not. Uh, it can just as easily and has been, he would argue, maladaptive. Uh, the problem he identifies is the power and the decisions of the elite. The elites, 
They make decisions that benefit themselves, but might be maladapted for the rest of us. Again, either not affected by it or because they're not affected by it, they don't care. They have very little information, therefore, about the effects of their decisions. And so for Bodley, it's the position of elites that keeps us from sustainability. The policymakers making policy in their own self-interest, not these impersonable variables like overpopulation and resource use. Last few things, uh, his theory of how wealth and power are distributed, this theory of elite directed growth, it focuses on how a handful of people drive contemporary human problems out of their own self-interest. So they can own an extra private island in their lifetime. This, Bodley's approach, contrasts sharply with the consensus view that the driving forces of global problems are the impersonable variables of population and economy, technology, energy, land use, and agriculture, as suggested by an intergovernment panel on climate change. Right. Institutions, agriculture doesn't do things. Agriculture doesn't make policy. Population doesn't make policy. People, decision makers within institutions make policy and make decisions. Right. Our problems are not natural human problems. They stem from the way our societies are being organized, which is by and large controlled by the elite, this small fall of hand, this handful of people with all the power. And if if the problem, right, it, it's quite convenient for the powers that be to blame these impersonal variables like population or, oh, we just have a resource shortage problem. You know, we live on a finite planet. What can you do? Um, because there's nothing you can really do about that, right? Oh, what can we do about that? If you frame the problem in terms of inequality, social organization, the way resources are distributed, the fact that so many people don't actually have access, if you frame the problem in terms of that, then the solution lies somewhere in that too, right? So how convenient to keep the focus, sort of keep our eye off the ball, right? Clarify humanization, and it's in Bodley, but it's, a, it's Bodley's word, right? It's sort of this term he's come up with to describe the main force that shapes how the tribal world organizes. Like what, what, motive, what drives them, right? Is it to make more money? Uh, like in the commercial world, and the driving force is making sure everyone's needs are met. That's what's valued. Like if you, ha if you have plenty to eat and someone next to you, you're a Kung villager and your belly's full and someone next to you goes hungry, that is not valued in that society. That is heavily stigmatized, right? You're eschewed by the rest of the members of that society. So it also goes back to what the values of the society are, right? Is it about endless profits? Is it about making sure humans are, are treated as humans? Um, so that's what humanization means. It means the focus is on me meeting people's needs. In the commercial world, this is not the focus um, of many of our policymakers. Institutions don't do things, people do them. But also, um, if people are the problem, if culture, the way we're organized is generating the problems, the, the hopeful note of that is that we can change that. There's nothing natural or inevitable or set in stone about how things are. It's, it was created by people and it can be changed by people. A last note on approaches in general. All approaches have strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, uh, the joke sort of starting with uh, the, well, sociologists, she's sort of marginalized. The psychologist says, oh, sociology is just applied psychology. Uh, the biologist says, psychology is just applied biology. Uh, the chemist says, you're just doing applied chemistry. Uh, the physicist says to the chemist, it's nice to be on top. And then you have the mathematician, right? The purest of the pure way over on the side until you take a calculus class. And anthropology is, I don't know, in fucking Arizona somewhere, super marginalized. What Talking to people, what could you possibly learn from an anthropological perspective? Um, the point is that all fields, all approaches have strengths. They also all have limitations and weaknesses um, in social and the more technical sciences. Human environment relations are too complex for any single approach to completely deal with them satisfactorily. Uh, and so one thing to keep in mind is know the limitations of your approaches, right? They all have biases and limits inherent in them. And so it's a strength to recognize that and try to account for it 
rather than pretend like it doesn't exist. And the questions you ask, the questions you ask are just as, if not more important than the answers you're looking for. Because if you're not asking the right questions, right, you're not framing the problem properly, then who cares about the solutions anyways, right? If the way you're framing the problem is flawed, then the solutions that you come up with are gonna be flawed too. Okay, we're gonna switch gears uh, to population and environment. 